This is Matt McLennan, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 14, for Monday, March 21st, 2011. This is part four of our series on Canadian TV writers, and this week we talk to TV and feature writer-producer Matt McLennan. Now, this episode, I gotta tell you, is jam packed with tips on breaking in that are applicable for both the U.S. and Canada. So it's a very, very exciting interview as as Matt, you're going to find out, is uh, is a very, very entrepreneurial and t tenacious individual who just did everything he could to break in and it really was very smart about how he did it. So, uh, so definitely some great tips that you're going to learn from Matt and we'll get to that as I mentioned in a second. But first... I did mention on the last couple of podcasts that I was going to be at the Ink Drinks event in Toronto on March 18th with my video camera. And so, as promised, here is some footage from that event. Enjoy. So she was on the podcast, but here we get to see her in real life. This is Karen Walton, best known for Ginger Snaps and a whole lot of other stuff. How are you doing, Karen? I'm very well, thanks, Greg. This is Ink Drinks, but what is Ink Drinks? Ink Drinks is a social night for film, television, animation, documentary, digital creators and writers from Toronto or visiting Toronto. And what kind of writing do you do? Uh, currently, I am writing a feature comedy script, and I do uh, episodic uh, television. Um, I wrote a spec for Flashpoint and also uh, uh, Law & Order SVU. And uh, so how long have you been coming to Ink Drinks? This is my first time. I'm a virgin, but they're being so gentle. I'm so happy. <laughs> and what kind of writing do you do? I just finished a feature film with a co-writer and we're working on getting that made. When is Ink Drinks? How often is it done? In Toronto we do Ink Drinks uh, every third Friday and we've just moved to a new home here at the Firkin on King West. And so how many people do you usually have at the events? It really varies, to be honest with you. Um, sometimes we can have 30, sometimes we can have 70. Uh, if we're really busy, we'll have over 100. And tell me the kind of writers that you might get or some of the shows that they do. Oh, gosh. There'll be writers here from most of the Canadian shows on air. Uh, there are Flashpoint writers. There are animation writers where you would recognize their titles. There are uh, some of the writers from 13 are here, some of the film writers and documentary writers. Basically, almost everything you see made out of Toronto or written by writers based in Toronto, sooner or later they show up here. And we're back. So that was the Ink Drinks event, which was a ton of fun. And if you want to find out about more of the Ink Drinks events, not just in Toronto, but in other Canadian cities, definitely go to Facebook and search for Ink Canada. Um, or you can follow Karen Walton on Twitter at Inc. Canada, and she will be sure to let you know about those events. I do want to remind you that there is some homework on the table, and time is running out. Of course, I'm talking about the TV Writer's Workbook by Ellen Sandler. I'm going to be talking to Ellen on April 1st, and so I urge you to go to tvwriterpodcast.com. You can order the book from the mini Amazon store that's on that site. It's under $11, very, very cheap, and make sure that you receive it in time, that you can read it, and it's not that long. It's about 260 pages or so, so you should be able to get, that, get through that pretty quickly. And send your questions to mail at tvwriterpodcast.com by March 30th. And uh, even if you don't actually send your questions in by then, it's very helpful for you to read the book before the interview is released the first week of April so that you'll have uh, a greater context for the interview and to be able to understand her um, great great teachings about TV and feature writing uh, more deeply. Uh, it's, a, it's an awesome book anyway, and a, a worthy book to be on your shelf, especially at that low price. 
And I'm very excited to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, and that's the Toronto Screenwriting Conference, which is taking place on April 9th and 10th. On April 9th and 10th, the Toronto Screenwriting Conference will host award-winning writers, executive producers, and best-selling authors all under one roof. It offers unprecedented education through masterclasses and breakout sessions with high-profile speakers from film and TV. Speakers include Leonard Dick from The Good Wife and House, Christine Zander of Raising Hope and Nurse Jackie, and Christopher Vogler, author of the best-selling book The Writer's Journey, as well as many more. For more information and to register, check out www.tsc.org. Um, but on to my interview with Matt McLennan. A little bio about Matt. Matt has had the privilege of working in both comedy and drama, um, actually a number of different genres, for over a dozen television shows, including The Listener, Degrassi, The Next Generation, Billable Hours, and Gemini-nominated productions such as Whistler, Republic of Doyle, and Fifteen Love. Matt's feature film work includes the Irvine Welsh's feature adaptation of Ecstasy. Recently, his original one-hour series, Three Days Grace, has entered development with Global Temple Street. And currently, Matt works as co-producer and writer on HBO's Call Me Fitz, starring Jason Priestley. I do want to mention that Matt's photo was done by Della Rollins, a Toronto-based photographer. You can find out more about her at www.dellarollins.com, D-E-L-L-A-R-O-L-L-I-N-S.com. But now, on to an interview that was jam-packed with tips on breaking in, my interview with writer-producer Matt McLennan. Enjoy. This is great, and I'm here with feature and TV writer producer Matt McLennan. How you doing, Matt? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well, thanks. Um, so I'm really, really excited to have you on the podcast. I know that um, every time uh, we have a new writer, I like to um, uh, focus on uh, things that you might be uh, experienced in that are different than some of the other writers that we've had. And, and I know as I look through your bio, there are some things that I think will be really cool for people to hear, and we'll get to those in, in a little bit. But uh, very, very glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you are the fourth Canadian writer. Uh, well, actually, technically fifth, because there was a, a Hollywood-based uh, Canadian, but, you know, she's working in Hollywood now. So the fourth <laughs> um, Canadian-based writer that uh, we've talked to on the podcast so far. And uh, and so I guess a great place to c get started is where you got started. You were born in Nepean. Is that how you say it? Yeah, I was born in uh, Nepean, Ontario, which is just outside of Ottawa. Just outside of Ottawa. And you went to school in... Uh, at Concordia University in Montreal. In, Mont in Montreal, yeah. And uh, and so at that point you were already in creative writing and history. So you you had the writing bug by that point already. But how did that manifest um, through university and coming out of university? Um, I kind of had the writing bug ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my process was just kind of owning up to that mm -hmm. um, and sort of saying. Yeah, I'd actually really want to commit to this and try to make it happen because it's a it's a daunting profession. A lot of people try to dissuade you from making a choice like that. Um, and so I worked after high school, which was a kind of a tumultuous experience for me. I went and just worked for a few years. I planted trees. I, I served French fries um, at a fast food court. I did all sorts of crazy jobs. And uh, basically, looking back at it now, I can sort of string that together into a narrative of just trying to avoid, you know, making a, a commitment to trying to jump into writing. So I had a girlfriend at the time, and she kicked my butt and got me to sort of realize that I needed to commit to being a writer. So I went and uh, committed to taking um, the creative writing program at Concordia. I had gotten accepted at you know, other universities for English and stuff, but I felt that that was sort of like a half measure. Like, if, if you want to write, you should go write, and that's what you should be doing. You shouldn't be, you know... If you're, I feel like if you're, I felt like at the time, and I still kind of feel like if you're walking into writing with a backup plan, then you haven't really committed to it. And I you think know, you really have to commit to it if you want to make it happen because it's very challenging. Um, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. And so you got into playwriting at that point. I started out, um, so at Concordia, you could choose your uh, major when you were in creative writing. And I started out as a poet, believe it or not. And um, mm -hmm. prose was my secondary uh, focus. And I kept writing these short stories, and uh, one of the props that these are great, but unfortunately they're all dialogue um, and plot, which means that they're plays. And I, I sort of scoffed at that because, you know, I was 
20 something and do everything and, uh, <laughs> and said, you know, I, I don't, I don't write plays. Um, but he was a smart guy and a really good writer. Um, and so I said, you know what, I've got an elective. So instead of taking an elective, like some bird course, I took playwriting and that's where I met uh, a guy by the name of Michelle Chaquette who taught playwriting and that's, he also taught screenwriting. So after I took his playwriting course, I took a screenwriting course and sort of the poetry and prose went by the wayside. Um, in part because I was horrible at it, and, <laughs> and in part because I felt it was a little bit daunting to be gearing your life towards creating, you know, work that doesn't really have an audience. There was a, a reading I went to, and I sort of realized everyone in the room was a poet or a friend of a poet, and I was like, well, what are we, <laughs> what are we writing here? You know. Uh-huh. Um, so that's why I made the transition into screenwriting and playwriting. I did a few plays in Montreal and tried to get into playwriting in Toronto, but it was very difficult and. Uh, and ended up getting into the business uh, as far as the uh, screenwriting goes. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so you started out near Ottawa. You went to school in Montreal. Your plays brought you to Toronto, and then you stayed here. No, I, I had a girlfriend at the time. She was an actress. Um, mm-hmm. and we, we were very much the starving artist sort of trope. Um, <laughs> and uh, she wanted to go to theater school. And the options were London, New York. And we were too broke to do that, so the other option was to go to Toronto. So she came to Toronto, and I was happy with that decision as well because it's one of the epicenters of of writing work mm-hmm. in Canada. So I thought, okay, well, we'll try this out, and uh, so we did that for. So that's, that's how I ended up moving to Toronto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so your first gig was as a, a production assistant on a Nero Wolf mystery. Um, yeah. And uh, and you also mentioned that you worked as a script reader. Was the script reading before or, or after that? It was kind of concurrent. Mm-hmm. My game plan was, I sort of came to Toronto and I was like, okay, well, I'll just obviously I have to get into the business and get to know everybody. So I basically stole an email list. Um, I won't say from where, so nobody replicates <laughs> this. But it wasn't a good idea. Um, and I emailed, uh, I think, 500 people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't send a form letter because I thought that was impersonal and um, just felt wrong. So I actually typed all these letters to everybody. And I said, it's sort of, I'd like to be a writer you know, if anyone has any idea of how to help me, basically. And um, the responses to that varied from um, where the hell was getting my email address to uh-huh. uh, to give up all hopes on there's there's no way the business is fine or and you'll never make it. And then there were other people who were like, you're, you're kind of crazy, but I think I have either a tip for you or I have a friend who might know somebody or... Um, so part of that email bomb resulted in me getting an, uh, an interview for Nero Wolf, but as Maury Shakin's assistant. What Maury Shakin's assistant? Wow. Yeah, Maury Shakin was on that show. He played Nero Wolf, mm-hmm. and uh, so I met Maury. He was a great guy, and and uh, but unfortunately it didn't work out. He I guess he had a different idea for who we wanted for an assistant, and so I ended up as a production assistant on Nero Wolf. So that was I tried other things. Like I tried to apply for. Um, you know, playwright resident stuff or um, playwriting programs or stuff like that. But none of that panned out. So mm-hmm. it's sort of like get a job in the industry or get a job out of the industry. Yeah. And my idea was that in the industry, I, I have a more likelihood of meeting someone who might help me get where I want to go. So. Hmm. Um. I, I'm just laughing because I did literally. Virtually the exact same thing. <laughs> I got an email list <laughs> off of somebody, and I sent out about three hundred emails. And and you're right, it was it was it was actually quite funny the range of responses that I got. <laughs> That's great. I mean, literally from people being fuming, mad at me being a spammer, and uh, uh, but yeah. but uh, interestingly, the all it takes is a few. I think I had about ten people that responded favorably. I, I set up some coffee times with them and that was a lot of how I got my start here in Toronto. Yeah, I met uh, through that email bomb, I got my first job, I met uh, a few people and I met a writer, still a friend of mine named Sean Hara, who was kind enough to help me out and sort of mentor me a bit. And, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and I also, uh, my friend Kristen DeFilippis, who got me in touch with Eric Trier, which is actually how I got my first job. So it actually kind of panned out. There's this weird sort of system in place that makes it very difficult to get very going, almost as if to sort of test your tenacity. And mm-hmm. then if you manage to hang in long enough and work hard enough and do crazy things like email hundreds of people and just try, mm-hmm. you, I've never seen anyone fail at, at getting where they're going. It's really strange, but it's the people who sort of fall by the wayside of the ones who just just gets too much and they give up, which I totally understand, but it's like it's um, it's this weird system in place where it's always 
gatekeepers to get you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's interesting how often we we come up with all the reasons why not. But yeah. when you when you plant enough seeds and you send up send out enough resumes or enough emails, somebody responds. It sounds hokey, right? But it, it sounds and I, I remember it sounded really like facile when people would tell me that, be like, Oh yeah, just just go do this, it'll be easy. And I was like, Oh, thanks. It's like that's useless. And then but the truth is it's just it really I don't know anyone who has if you ask anyone how they got in the business, invariably that's the story. It's like they just kept at it for you know, some people trip into it, but usually it's like I just out of the pavement until my feet were raw and I ended up, you know, and that tests your commitment, which I think is important because I wouldn't suggest anyone become a writer unless they really, really love it because it's a, it's a demanding job. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a demanding life, you know, so not yeah. that we're so hard done by it, but it's just <laughs> like, you know, I think I feel very grateful, but it's just, I feel like you should really, really love it if that's what you want to commit your life to because writing takes so much time and so much effort to get where you want to go. It's like, if you don't really love it, and that's not, if you're not following the sort of love, then you're just, uh, you're not going to be a happy, happy writer, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, and I do think um, with what you explained about your, your approach in those emails, um, there were a few crucial little details that, that, uh, that I think are important to point out. Um, one of them is you, you were focused on wanting to write. It was, you could see that there was a passion for actually writing and not just wanting a job. Number two, you were very specific. Mm -hmm. Um, you didn't just do a form letter to everybody. Yeah, I felt that that was disingenuous. Yeah, and uh, and it's something that it, that I uh, learned way, 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 way back. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read. There's a book, How to Make It in Hollywood, by Linda Buzzle. Even though it, it talks about Hollywood, a lot of the principles that it talks about are applicable anywhere. And one of the things that she said was, if if you approach somebody with the perspective of wanting advice, you're far more likely to get a meeting or a phone call with them than if you're just asking for a job. And I, th I think um, you were very intuitive at, at that point um, in asking for their advice rather than asking directly for work. No, I think that's a great point, too, because the truth is, like, you know, there aren't writing jobs floating around. It's not like getting a newspaper route. Like, they're pretty hard to come by, and they just don't come up that often. So if your end goal is, hey, can you help me find a job, they, they'll just say no, and then you're, you're sort of, that's it, you're done, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my my approach was exactly that. that was just sort of like you know I'd love to be a writer if I can. Is there other work that's available? Because I'd love to build my network. And if you can't help me, one of the things I thought was really important too, I, I learned in a book somewhere. I read all these crazy books too. Um, was whenever you leave a meeting, ask that person if they can refer you to someone else. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how you build a network. And and then you call that next person. You say, hey, you know, so and so sent me by. Thought you might be able to help me. You know. And then suddenly you have an introduction. So you're not just some stranger. You're like so-and-so's contact, right? And mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of credibility. And then you can sort of – you got to keep building that and building that until, you, until your opportunity shows up. I think it's, somebody said that about luck or something. Luck is just uh, tenacity and waiting for an opportunity or something like that. Where it's like you can only be lucky if you're trying all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's very, very true in, uh, in television, <laughs> in pretty much any job, but particularly writing. I think so. Yeah, I think in life. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and so tell me a little bit. Uh, and I'm actually quite fascinated because um, it, your approach actually um, is not that common from the Canadian writers that I've heard, but it is common in Hollywood. And uh, and so I mean, in in Hollywood, a lot of the prevailing wisdom wisdom is get a job as a production assistant, um, get a job as a script reader. Um, but I, I haven't talked to anybody in Canada yet who actually worked as a script reader. So I'm very fascinated about this. Tell me about being a script reader. You, you worked for Telefilm and Alliance Atlantis? Um, I worked for Telefilm and Alliance Atlantis. And I worked uh, privately as well for um, directors and for producers and stuff like that who would, you know, between you and me, would be very busy and they would want some sort of notes to give but didn't want to go through and, and uh, <clears throat> have to go come through the whole script, so I would go do that, and they would sort of review my notes and the ones they would, like they would take and use and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't. This is the thing is, I didn't have a, I didn't have a real mentor or anyone to sort of, you know, I didn't have any guidance. I, I remember emailing the guild and sort of asking, and I couldn't find any information, and so it was just sort of like, I just broke it down this really logical idea. So I was like, well, if I can't be a writer right now, I'll have to accept that, um, and I'll work on my stuff and try to get better at writing, and then I'll try to find other jobs which will you know, sort of help me because while I'm working, I'll be learning, right? So mm -hmm. so 
the idea was like work at a bookstore and I felt like that was like an option and then I could work, have more time to work on writing. But I was like, if I work in the industry, at least I'll, maybe I'll brush shoulders with somebody and who knows, right? I mean, that's how things happen. So there's that. That's why I decided to get into the PA thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as script reading goes, they, it, it doesn't really exist a lot of script readers, which I think is, to this day, I think is kind of crazy because you pay a script reader for a couple hundred bucks and they can... You know, go through your, go through all of your scripts and find a, a you know do a real quick pass to tell you if you've got a really great script or a bad one and then you, you don't waste a lot of time you might find the next big hit you never know right so so I tried to find out who who hires readers and uh, Telefilm was one Harold Greenberg Fund is another and uh, and then Alliance Atlantis at the time was still sort of doing some feature work mm -hmm. and so I read a book I see that on my bookshelf still. Somewhere. It's called Reading for a Living. Oh, okay. Um, which I would recommend to anyone read. It's uh, it's great actually in terms of just learning some basic stuff about stories. Um, and it's from a guy who worked for years as a reader in in L.A. And uh, so he walks you through how to evaluate a story, what a reader's report looks like, all that sort of stuff. And so I basically, I can't believe I did this actually. I was like, oh yeah, I can. I'm a reader. So I went and bought this book, and then I generated sample coverage, which he suggested, and then I just sort of said, well, obviously there's a reader job out there, mm -hmm. and so I went to find them, and then one job led to another, uh, and then I got referral jobs and stuff like that. And some of those referral jobs uh, would lead to story editing work, or they'd lead to writing work as well. So that was my other sort of angle I was working on. Very, very cool. Well, they, I mean, these are all really, really practical um, methods that uh, I think anybody who wants to break in would do very well to listen to all this stuff. It's, it's funny because I feel like I feel like I was kind of insane when I started out, but now that, I, now that I'm having this conversation, I'm like, oh, that was pretty smart. Like, <laughs> yeah. We're totally nuts because at the same time, I, was, I had also I decided – well, after being a production assistant on Your Wolf, I got a lot of phone calls for, you know, I became a director's assistant as well and stuff like that. And I sort of got these calls for that kind of work. And then I had to sort of say, well, do you want to be on the production side or do you want to be on the writing side? Because if you go down this road where you're constantly getting PA jobs and director's assistant jobs, like you're kind of putting yourself on the road to be a producer, maybe, or an AD or mm -hmm. a story, uh, um, uh, an office production coordinator. Which are we're all great jobs, but it's not really what you want to do. So, like, what's you know, get back to your goal here. So, I said, okay, okay, no more jobs. That's it. I'm just going to uh, have a huge student loan and credit card debt. And I said, I'm just going to subsist on my credit cards. And one of two things will happen: I will make it as a writer, or I'll have to declare bankruptcy and then I'll <laughs> prove to myself that this is just a fool's a, a fool's errand, and I should give up being a writer. Right? Uh -huh. It would be a insane part right now. I would never recommend that to anybody. It was just ridiculous. Hmm. So I would um, pay my rent with those little, they give you those little checks from credit cards where you can write checks to people. So I would do that, run up my one credit card, apply for a new one, and then flip the balance to that. Oh, one no. Start over. Oh, it was insane. It was just like ridiculous. Uh -huh. I was about three or four months away from being completely bankrupt, being an idiot, like totally just stupid, um, stupid plan. And and I was working on um, writing a spec, and I had taken this great course with a, uh, a writer named Deb Nathan, who's just brilliant, just mm -hmm. a writer. Um, and, she, and I wrote a spec script for uh, Six Feet Under, which was really hot at the time. I loved as a show. And, and that's how I ended up getting my first writing gig. One of the people from the 500 emails that I sent said, hey, I have a friend who's looking for a coordinator. So I met them. They happened to be in Montreal. I happened to be in Montreal. And that's how I met... Uh, Derek Schreier and Karen Trevesco, and we gave him my, my first big break. And that was 15 Love? That was 15 Love, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about that show. I mean, you you were on that show for three seasons? Yeah. And and you moved up. Like, you started assistant story editing, then senior story editor and executive story editor. Yeah. And it, and I was really interested. You also were a music consultant and music supervisor on that show. Yeah. yeah. It's... Uh, so I was in Montreal, that relationship, which got me to Toronto, it sort of imploded because, um, you know, life happens. And then I found this opportunity. And so I really had nothing going on except my job. And so I just threw myself into the show. I was so excited to have, you know, a gig. And, um, and Karen Trevesco and Derek Schreier are two of the finest people, you know, to work for. And uh, I mean, honestly, they're just incredible. And they're, they don't, they don't say this, but their rule is like, if you want to excel and you want to try something, they'll just let you do it. And so 
they let me sit in on all these production meetings and sort of go on location scouts and go to post and color timing and mixes and all sorts of stuff, like just to be a fly on the wall and, and uh, you know, wardrobe meetings, prop meetings, all these things which years later have come in so handy because um, you have context when you walk into these things, right? And so I had a few friends who were indie musicians and they were sort of not caring to weren't sure what to do about music. And I said, well, listen, maybe I can solicit some people you know, I don't. We don't have a huge budget. We didn't have money for tracks. We didn't have money for um, music at all, really. And like, we were block shooting seven episodes at a time just to try to wring every dollar mm -hmm. um, out and put it on the screen. You know. Um, so I appealed to people who were indie musicians, and I was just honest with them. I'm like, listen, we don't. We have X amount of money per track. I know it's horrible, and it's like we're just a poor show. And uh, and it really was true. It wasn't a line. And it was and it was like, if you guys have stuff, like send it in. And this is just when I guess it's like CD burning and stuff had reached this point where it was like really cheap, and the internet had grown to the point where it was like the place to be for a musician. Mm -hmm. And so I got flooded with these submissions. And so I just would be working on scripts and work on script coordinating and stuff like that, story editing, and I would just have earphones on and listen to tracks and just, you know, go through CDs, um, trying to do selects for music. And, uh, and you know, Karen and Derek liked the stuff that was coming out. I mean, indie musicians were very happy because they had that, you know, they could go on a TV show and that would be a credit and they would get a little bit of money to help them get by. And, and I was happy because I love music and I love writing. And so it all kind of worked out and everybody was really happy. And some of those artists actually ended up being Quite, quite famous and popular, like Edwin Soundclash and stuff. I remember it was one of their first like uh, albums ever, and they had sort of submitted it, and, uh, and they're not kind of big. And so every once in a while, I'll see one of those bands come closer, and I'll be like, "That's oh, so funny that they've done so well." So wow, well that I mean that is both fascinating and extremely cool. Yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> I mean, what do you think? What do you think about it? I mean, who who would think about about? Uh, I mean, it just reminds me. Just this week, I watched that movie once. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't seen it. I've been recommended so many times on the list. You know, you, you really you really should. But it's it's that that sort, yeah. sort of thing happens where they just they need to do a recording and they bring people in off the street and it ends up being a great recording. But uh, I I love yeah. that kind of indie approach and not and not. Um, not doing the conventional. Yeah, I was worried that we were going to get some session musician who, you know, sort of doing a, a money gig or whatever and didn't really care. And, and I, the thing is, it's a teen show, right? So if your music sucks, you're, you're doomed, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, a teen show. Because people like, at that age group, music is just key, right? So Yeah, well, I'm, but at the same time, teens are all about the new thing. And uh, that must have been so cool to have, like, new music that nobody else had heard before. Yeah, it, it was... Uh... It was, I was amazed. I was literally floored by the A, the number of submissions, and B, the quantity of talent. Like, I looked at these stacks of CDs, and I was like, 80% of these are going to suck. Like, there's going to be some guy who just grabbed his dad's A track and recorded it in the garage, and it's going to be awful. And it was, it, they weren't. Like, 80% of them were great, you know, and 20% of them were just amazing. So I was just, the, the talent in Canada is, and it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're going to, um, Step aside for a second, and I know that you're now with Alpern Group uh, for representation. Yeah. But tell me about at what point did you get your first agent, and, and tell me a little bit about that. I didn't have an agent. I tried. I did the whole thing. <laughs> I remember that when I was I went part of my multi prong plan was uh, to send out uh, letters to agents. So I sent out. I read a book on that and what agents want and stuff like that. And so I sent. I did sort of cold call letters and uh, had a few meetings, a few agents. But of course, it was just like I was a kid who wanted to write. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't, I had a couple samples, there were plays, and it was sort of, but I didn't really go anywhere. And then after 15 Love started, I went back and, and knocked on all those doors again. And suddenly they were, you know, wide open. Like I'm knocking on a door with a bag of money. I'm like, who wants it? Much, <laughs> right. So, it's a very different response when you're a working writer than when you're not. Um, yeah. And so I went through another round of, of, of agents then. And, um, I had an agent for a while, and it didn't work out. After a few years, we just sort of—I think it was just—it just wasn't quite, quite working for me. So I, I just recently signed up with Jeff Alpern, who has uh, been great. He's a really great agent. So. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff Alpern is uh, out of LA. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He—I think he used to—I don't want to lie, but I think he used to work for like one of the big agencies, and he's been in the business forever. Mm -hmm. He's got a phenomenal reputation. 
a lot of the showrunners are with Jeff as well, so that's um, that's great. And and he's based in LA, which is great because I think more and more geography is getting less and less relevant mm-hmm. to everybody. Um, as far as globalization goes, like you, you, even in the states, like people, you know, they're buying formats from the BBC and then you know shooting them in Canada, and producing them in the states, and it's just sort of like I think it's way really more important just to have someone who's got access to all the stuff down in the states, just in case. I think I should be able to have access to every market that I can possibly work in because I think that's just smart. So mm-hmm. it's not about wanting to work outside of Canada. I'm happy to work anywhere. There's a great show with great people. So it just having an agent who's based down there gives you the versatility to do work up here and, and air down there as well. It's much easier to sort of do that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll get to some cross-border work that you've done with uh, Call Me Fitz a little later. But before that, I um, I know we don't have a, a lot of time. And uh, and so maybe what you could do, um, just between then and now, share with me some some highlights. Um, I, I could just roll through a bunch of... Sh- uh, you have your IMD, IMDb credits. I mean, you did a film short called Frankly, a uh, TV series called Billable Hours, The Whistler, Life with Derek, Overruled, Degrassi, The Next Generation, Wild Roses, Republic of Doyle, and uh, you did some freelance scripts, I think, for The Listener. Yeah, I've worked on The Listener as well. Yeah. And then The Fifth was my last job. And then I also have a feature that just got shot, um, Irving Welsh's Ecstasy, which just finally shot. And... Um, and I'm working on another feature now, which I'll hopefully shoot soon. We'll see. So yeah, it's been a it's been a, a great run. I've had a lot of work, which has been really I feel really grateful for, and um, always worry that we'll we don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people look, tend to look at my resume when I'm in um, meetings and stuff, and they, I, they get this look on their face like, like, so what do you want to be doing? Because your credits, my credits range from like you said, like short film to teen shows to like adult sex comedy to like half hour comedies that want to drama and stuff like that. So that I think is a difference between the industry here and the industry in the States a bit is that you can be a bit of a jack of all trades in mm-hmm. Canada because there are fewer jobs around. Whereas in the States I would never recommend anyone accumulating their resume in the States because it's you it's, you should really niche yourself as far as I understand because there's so much more opportunity out that you really need to focus down on okay, if you want to be a one hour drama or a half hour comedy guy or so yeah, so it's been, I feel really fortunate. I've also worked in a ton of different provinces and um, all over the place, which has been great as well. Like, I, I tend to be very flexible and versatile as far as gigs go. Like, if someone wants me to, you know, I've lived in Calgary, St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, like Montreal, um, Vancouver. So I've really toured the whole country uh, working, which has been kind of cool as well. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we can just take a second and talk about the the logistics of being a Canadian writer, because um, just as I, I mean, we we started this podcast and and I was talking to pretty much exclusively writers based in LA, and then the last few podcasts I've been talking to um, Canadian writers, and in my general impression is that Canadian writers are entrepreneurs a lot more than than the American writers, and uh, um, it's it's not necessarily a take whatever you can get, but it's more being willing to adapt yourself to different things as they come. Um, yeah, I, but, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, yeah, and, and I, I hear, like, say, for instance, in, in the States, you you will become a staff writer, and you might do freelance scripts um, if you're pretty early on in your career. But I, I hear of very well-established Canadian writers who are doing freelance scripts. Um, and so definitely there's a different landscape in, in that sense. Um, can, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I, I remember early on, Derek Schreier from 15 Love, I, I got another job on another show, and I went to their story room, and I was like, wow, this is like completely different than the room that Derek has. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was sort of like, this is wrong. And Derek was like, no, 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 like every room is different, and, and there's no wrong or right about this stuff. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Um, so there is a lot of difference even within – Canada, going from room to room, like how people want to set up their shows, how they want to, like how many scripts they want before camera, how many do they want staff, do they want to farm ad scripts to freelance, you know, there's a lot of variety as far as that stuff goes, mm-hmm. And but I think, you're, I mean, I think it's accurate to say that you really, because of this, like, you know, we don't have 30 person rooms divided into three, you're like, there's some in, insane rooms in the States, which I'd love to be a part of that are just mm-hmm. like giant, you know, mm-hmm. um, so it's a very different experience 
but the benefits of being up here, I think, is that, you, like, like with Karen and Derek, for example, like I would never be able to be a first-time writer <laughs> and be going to all these meetings and seeing all this stuff and you know doing music, supervising all this sort of stuff. It just never would happen. So it's like because uh, there's so few hands on deck, if you if you're really ambitious, you, there's a lot of opportunity to learn and to grow and to experience a lot more than you would maybe if you were just one of you know a bunch of writers on a on a show in the states mm, sort of a bigger fish in a smaller pond yeah so exactly right so it's like it's like oh i need someone to cover you know a casting meeting so you're like okay I'll, I'll i can go do that if you want and so suddenly you're in a casting session which you're not in a casting session in the states as far as i understand you know unless you're really high up and as far as the writing goes right mm. Yeah, I mean that's the that's one of the chief differences. I think it's just because it's sort of skeletally staffed. There's a lot more opportunity to fill in the gaps sometimes if you have a good showrunner who sort of just wants to fire you some extra stuff and and just you know go cover off on something. There's a lot of opportunity to learn. You know? mm -hmm. Well, I think I think a very important thing is is taking those opportunities. Yeah, I think I think so. And I mean, television is such a collaborative medium. It's it's pretty incredible because working as a PA and, and, and then working with Karen and Derek was interesting because it, I sort of got to see what everyone does. And on a television show, everyone tends to believe that their job was the most important and that if they didn't show up for work, that the wheels would fall off and we'd all be destroyed. And everybody sort of feels that way, I think. And everybody's right, which is the interesting thing. It's like um, every department is key. Every department needs to be allowed to do a great job and, and if you see them all doing their job and you sort of get it you're like oh like here's what you know most do here's the people in proxy here's the people in, in set deck too and, and, and that's really important i think if, if you're looking to be a showrunner down the road because it gives you some context for everybody else's day mm -hmm. very very cool well, because of time, I, th I think we'll just get to your, your current projects now. And uh, I know one sure. that you're uh, really excited to talk about is Call Me Fitz, starring Jason Priestley, uh, already aired in Canada, um, and will be coming to HBO, um, or sorry, will be coming to Direct TV in April. Um, yeah. It was on HBO Canada, and uh, you were a writer co-producer on season two, and you'll be back this spring on season three already. Um, yeah. So what can you tell me about that show? It's a crazy show, and it's a great show, and it's a really unique show um, to be on. And it's some, like, one of the best crews and casts and, and, and writing rooms I've ever been part of. And uh, I mean, the, the short pitch is basically Jason Priestley is stars as a completely debaucherous uh, used car salesman, like like utterly deplorable. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day his conscience shows up and just manifests and starts messing with his life. Oh no! Um, yeah, so it's sort of like. I mean, my, my elevator pitch for it is, you know, a guy in his contents walk into a bar. Like, it's just like, and that's where the humor comes from, because I think everybody has those inner struggles with, like, you know, do you want to be the good guy or the bad guy or how it works? So mm -hmm. that's sort of the, that's the high concept thing that keeps it going. Mm -hmm. And a lot of physical comedy, too. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great, some phenomenal actors on that show who are just, just, it's hard being on set because you just, you almost blow takes all the time because they're just so funny. You almost burst are laughing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's a family comedy, which is kind of interesting um, because it's his father, um, Peter McNeil is, uh, is there and his crazy sister and stuff like that. And, um, and it's interesting because they're they're like completely dysfunctional. It's a bit, bit like we sort of not to compare it to Archie Bunker, but he's a bit the father's a bit like that. Like he's just equally deplorable in a different way. He's like sort of racist and, and selfish and sort of stuff. So it's it's really interesting way to look at sort of the dark side of people, mm -hmm. but always with the laugh. So it's not it's not depressing. It's just sort of like here's my alcoholic racist father. Ha! Ah, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> playing for the funny, you know, as opposed uh -huh. to playing for the drama. So. Very, very cool. And uh, and so you're co-producing, which means that you, you do have a lot of those other responsibilities. Yeah, so the, the showrunners, um, Sherry Elwood, and she's the you know, creative head, and her right-hand man is um, Dennis Eaton, who's just an incredible, another incredible Canadian writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I'm sort of third guy up, so whatever needs to be covered off, because of my experience, I have, I've just done a lot of crazy stuff, so they're just sort of like, they can feel confident sending me to a meeting if they need someone to cover off on that or, you know, looking at a cut to give notes or anything like that. They can sort of, whatever they want me to do, I'll just cover off and do. Um, because I came in on second, <laughs> because I came in on second season, they already sort of had a machine that was working, so I just sort of came in and 
you know, um, whatever, whatever I could do to help them, you know, reach the goal of creating a second season that they really love was just, that was sort of my mandate. So. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. So, so in the States, um, definitely watch for that on direct TV in April, uh, you know, early April, late April, when that's coming, Mid April, I think it's 20 something, April 20 something is the first season premiere. So you can get it from the beginning. Um, yeah, we have a lot of us, uh, viewers to the podcast. Yeah. It's on direct TV and we're hoping it does really well down there. Cause it's, uh, it'd be great for, for Jason too. It's such a cool role for him to, a lot of people just remember him as Brandon Walsh from 90210. And this is just completely different character. So it's kind of fun. Great. So Call Me Fitz is the one to watch for. And uh, and also just, as you mentioned, completed production uh, feature film. And now is this your first feature? It's my first produced feature. Yeah, first produced feature. So Irv, Irv, yeah. Irvine Wal Welsh's Ecstasy. Yeah, Irvine Welsh. Is, so he's the guy who wrote Train Swallowing. I don't know if you remember that movie. Oh, right, right, right. Um, and uh, so this is, it's based on a book. Uh, called Ecstasy, which is uh, four short stories, mm -hmm. and it basically takes a look at the sort of ecstasy e subculture, and it's a long story, which is interesting for Irving Welsh because he's just he's a really gritty writer, so it's interesting. Very very cool, and that stars uh, Adam Sinclair, Kristen Kruk, and uh, Billy Boyd. Yeah, who I noticed was on your yeah she was I know she was on your blog or something one of your photos I think. Yeah, uh, actually uh, I was in L.A. Uh, about a year and a half ago, and and uh, had a chance to interview interview her in person. Um, she oh, is just a sweetie. Actually, <laughs> the funny thing happened. Um, it was uh, only supposed to be a short interview, but it was on set, and they kept on stopping the interview because they were rolling. And so we ended up just right. chatting for a half hour um, right. off off camera uh, in the middle, in between the uh, the takes. So that was pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty exciting that she's. Uh, the, the co-star in it or the star of it. Um, mm -hmm. So looking forward to seeing that out. Yeah, very, very cool. So, I'll tell you the short version of the story, but I I worked as a reader and I got the script as a reader and I sort of said, here, you know, here's some issues that I, I would try to correct. And then he said, well, how did you, you know, how would you correct these? And I said, well, story editing work. And I grew in the story editing gig. And then I said, well, here's my, where I propose the solutions. And then, and then to Rob Hayden came back and said, well, what if you wrote these solutions? And I was like, oh, well, I, yeah, I'd be willing to, <laughs> cool. I'd be willing to write on, on an Irving Lawson movie. Yeah, I could do that. So, But that was like 2005 or something. And wow. he had a real lot of a real struggle trying to get the financing together between Canada and the UK and, mm -hmm. and, and Scotland and stuff like that. So he finally managed to pull it off this year. And so it was uh, just elated to find out that it was getting so great. The snail's pace of features. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it, I mean, that that's a story I hear from U.S. and Canada, is it takes so much longer to get them out than, uh, I mean, yeah. TV is so immediate. Yeah, it's funny because features are like, everything's imminent and urgent, and it's like, ah, it's not going to happen. And then it becomes imminent and urgent again, and it's just sort of like, you just, I, I, I sort of, well, I had to make a change in my, my head, head space about all the stuff, but it's like, there's really nothing you can do about whether or not something's going to get made, or, or if it's going to get well received, or you can't control the product you just can't like it's going into a marketplace mm -hmm. all you can control is your process so it's like the more you can focus on having a good day and just doing some good work and, and the less you can worry about you know paying your rent and stuff like that the the, the happier you're going to be i think you know so, and that's you know it's aspirational i'm not saying i don't freak myself out every day worrying about stuff but um very very cool i think it's a lot more important to work. yeah it's good, it's good to worry about the process and and so and now that you've uh, you've tasted uh, a produced feature um, what's coming up for you? I, I, I mean, I know you've got season three of Call Me Fits, but uh, would you like to do more feature work, or would you want to stay in TV, or, or um, what would you like to do? I'd like to sort of do both, really. I mean, they're, they're completely different. It's, I feel really privileged that I did a bit of poetry, I've done a bit of playwriting, I've done a bit of like, short story writing, and I've you know, got into television work and features and stuff, so it's like, it's all similar, but it's just sort of basically like what every story lends itself to a form in particular, I think like there's certain stories that would just not be good features that would be great television shows, or would, would be great plays but not not succeed as a as a movie. So it's it's nice to be able to sort of have an idea of what each one offers, and so to be able to put that back and forth them is really fun because then if I happen on a story that I think is really great that I find really engaging that I think other people will find engaging, I can try to get it out regardless of whether it's a feature or a or television, or whatever. I happen to love TV work because it's collaborative, and I think that anything that any great thing that's ever been made has always been the product of 
a movement or a group of people or something like that. And I think that's true of television as well. It's like we have a great team and a great crew and it just sings. Like there's just no feeling like that. And, and it's great because it sucks sometimes to be in a room by yourself just typing, staring at the wall. Like it's just you don't know if you're doing well or poorly. And, and you know, you can get a lot of feedback when you're doing television work where it's like if you write a stinker script, you know about it, you know, mm-hmm. you fix it. And, uh, or, you know, if you don't have, I remember, you know, some of the best, if you're in a great show, you can walk, you know, you can deal with a problem and walk in a room and say like, I don't have a solution to this. Anyone else have an input? And then, you know, they get invited in and then it's like, oh yeah, sure. Like, what if you did this? And then suddenly you've got a solution, which isn't yours and everyone knows it. And, but you're happy with that. And then it's like, it becomes a, an hour and it's a work of hours, you know, it's like, um, mm-hmm everybody's sort of contributing and then everybody gets invested and then everybody cares that that everything's done well and everybody just does a little bit more work and works a little bit harder. And I think that's where you make something great. Nothing can make, great things don't come because you just want to make money. Like great things, it just doesn't work that way. So, mm. Very, very cool. Well, I, I think that's a great place to, to start to wrap things up. And uh, what I usually end with is uh, if you have – any advice to people trying to break in or trying to maybe they have broken in and and want to um, get further in in their career? Uh, I think we've covered a lot of that as as we've gone. So, I, um, but do you have any other advice that you can give somebody breaking in? I, the advice that was given to me was just be tenacious. Tenacity is the only thing that's going to matter. Like, if you suck at, at being a writer, you can learn how to be a better writer. It may take a long time. You may never, you know, you may never get really really great, but you know, just keep working at stuff. And if you can't find your way in, just keep trying. And so, because the moment you, you decide that it's not going to happen, you decide it's not going to happen. So it's not going to happen. Like it's just, uh, and it's, it's hard to fight that, but I think that the, the more stubborn and tenacious you can be, the, the better off you're going to, you're going to be trying to, trying to get your way in. Very well said. And, uh, and so we will wrap it up here, but um, you're on Twitter. I am. Yeah. Uh, just at Matt McLennan. Matt McLennan, M-A-T-T-M-A-C-L-E-N-N-A-N? Yeah, that's correct. Very, very cool. Um, and also, I made a deal with myself uh, when I first started out. I, like I said, I didn't have anybody to sort of me a hand as far as um, what to do and learning what to do and, and finding ways in and stuff like that. So if anyone does want to email me, I'm, I'm open to uh, answering emails from people as well, if that helps anybody. Because I promised myself I'd be available to help other people because – was kicking around help me so cool um, if anybody does want to contact me they're welcome to do so and your your email address is in text i-n-t-e-x-t at gmail.com in text at gmail.com well that is uh, is very generous and gracious of you um i know uh there are not as many mentors as there could be in this industry. And, and so when somebody takes it upon themselves to, to do that kind of thing, I, I think it's a, it's a very noble thing. Well, and to that point, thanks so much for doing this webcast because it's uh, what's really important for writers is to know that other writers are out there and that, you know, they've been through that struggle or they have advice or something like that. And these resources, your resource, the one you're creating right now, it's like they're hard to find. Like you just, you just, there are not a lot of people who bother doing stuff like this. So kudos to you for, for bothering because it's great. I mean, if I had found this resource when I was, you know, 22, I would have been elated, you know. Well, thanks so much to you as well. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time. And honestly, I, I, I this was just jam packed with, with tips that I think are very, very helpful for uh, people breaking in. Oh, cool. No worries. Yeah. If, you, if I can ever be of help to you, man, just let me know. Like I really do appreciate the work you're doing. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible. Great. Well, and hopefully I'll have a chance to meet you. Uh, you mentioned that you knew uh, Karen Walton. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, I, I don't know if you'll be able to be at the Ink Drinks event. I'm going to try to make it out. Like, I've got this uh, feature I kind of owe by the end of March. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's a little bit here right now. Um, I'm just staring at two curves on the wall, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to turn this into a script. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, if I can make it out, I would just love, I'd love to. I mean, I love Karen and the Ink Drinks events. So I try to go to all the time because it's mm-hmm. another way to sort of just be out and make a community and, you know, help people get where they're going and stuff like that yeah great well I'm, I'm sure i'll meet you at some point yeah for sure yeah so thanks again and uh best of luck to you all right thanks okay thanks take care okay, bye-bye 
And that was my wonderful interview with Matt McLennan. And boy, didn't I promise you that that would be jam-packed with tips. And, and honestly, it was a great collection of tips that, uh, that we don't necessarily hear all in one place. So it was, it was interesting to, um, to hear. And it, even more than the tips themselves, what I really appreciated about Matt was, uh, his tenacity. And you could really tell that he was going to break in no matter what. And it didn't matter what technique he was going to focus on in on exactly what he wanted and get there. And I think that's the attitude that we need to have if we want to break into TV writing or actually any field in, in television or film is you got to just not take no for an answer. And if you do get a no this way, just Shift around it and go another way. It, keep your eye on the target and just keep on going. Um, I appreciate that uh, Matt actually gave his email address. I want to remind you, in text at gmail.com. That's I-N-T-E-X-T at gmail.com. Uh, what what a, a generous gesture to offer that chance to contact him directly and get his uh, feedback and advice. You can follow Matt on Twitter, Matt McLennan. M-A-T-T-M-A-C-L-E-N-N-A-N is how you follow him on Twitter. And uh, just in general, Twitter is a great way to connect with writers. I want to remind you about the massive Twitter database at tvwriterpodcast.com. There are over 400 writers that you can find out their Twitter addresses and IMDB links. And if you want to follow them all in one place, there's a link at the top that you can just follow them as a list a Twitter list, and that makes it a lot easier for you. So I urge you to um, use that resource. It's available for you. I want to remind you that you can follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle. You can email me, mail at tvwriterpodcast.com. Remember your homework. Go to tvwriterpodcast.com. Buy Alan Sandler's book, The TV Writer's Workbook. Read it and send in your questions by March 30th. Have a wonderful writing week. Next week will be the last episode of our Canadian TV Writer series. Um, and then we'll be on to Ellen Sandler's interview the first week of April. And there's some great interviews coming after that. Boy, I can't wait. But until next time, bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. 